We're going to finish our series on the subject of prayer. So turn with me, if you would, to the book of Matthew, chapter 6. We're going to read verses 9 through 13 and just follow along with me as I read what is known as the Lord's Prayer. It says, After this manner, therefore pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, as I've stated over and over again, the Lord's Prayer was never intended to be a statutory prayer to be memorized and recited word for word. Instead, it was meant to be an outline for us to follow as we pray. You see, the Lord's Prayer is thematic which simply means that it consists of different subjects that we're supposed to pray for. In fact, the Lord's Prayer has seven different subjects, and these subjects cover every aspect of life. So your prayer life is meant to cover everything that you need in your life. Now, so far we've covered the first five subjects in the Lord's Prayer, so now we're ready to move on to the sixth subject, which is praying that God would lead us away from temptation and deliver us from evil. Now, as you can see, you're actually praying for two different things. You're praying that God would lead you away from temptation, and you're praying that God would deliver you from evil. Those are two different things. One deals with temptation, the other with evil. So let's start with the first, praying that God would lead us away from temptation. Now, to really understand what we're praying for, we have to understand how a person is tempted. So turn with me, if you would, to the book of James, chapter 1. We're going to read verses 13 and 14, and we're going to find how we're tempted. We're going to find out how that happens. Notice what James wrote. Let no man say when he is tempted, I'm tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Now, verse 14 explains explicitly how a person is tempted. According to verse 14, we're tempted when we're drawn away of our own lust. Do you see that? But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust. Now, I want you to underline that phrase, drawn away. That phrase is translated from the Greek word ex elko, and ex elko is a hunting and fishing term that means to lure from safety or to draw out from hiding. Now, according to verse number 14, our lust is what draws us or lures us away from God and from the the safety that he provides. Yeah. According to James, lust is a force that pulls us and draws us from God. And when I say from God, I mean away from God. So in essence, we're tempted when something we lust for begins to lure us away from God. But let's go a little bit further. Look back at verse number 14, and I want you to underline the word own. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust. In other words, we can't blame the devil for being tempted. We can't even blame God for being tempted because he tempts no man. People, it's our own lust that causes us to be tempted. So let me give you a principle. Everyone knows what a principle is, right? If you've been coming here for any length of time, you should be able to define a principle. If you first started coming, you might not know what a principle is. You think you know because you've probably been at churches where pastors have taught you biblical principles. But you really didn't know what that is. So let me give you the definition of what a principle is. A principle is a fundamental truth that explains how something works. As an example, marriage principles are fundamental truths that explain how marriage works. Financial principles are fundamental truths that explain how finances work. Well, I'm going to give you this morning a principle that explains how temptation works. So if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. This is the principle. We're tempted by the things we desire, which also means we cannot be tempted with the things we have no desire for. Now, that's very important for you to understand how temptation works. So let me repeat that principle again. We're tempted by the things we desire, which also means we cannot be tempted with things we have no desire for. Now, I'm going to use drugs and food as an example to illustrate what I'm talking about. The truth is, I'm not tempted to buy drugs or to do drugs because I have no desire to get high. Life is good enough by itself for me. But I am tempted to overeat 
and to eat things that aren't good for me because I have a desire for things that taste good. Anyone with me? But people, that's why I'm overweight. Not only am I tempted, but I have the tendency to give in to temptation. You can see it. The proof is in the pudding right here. Now, because we all have different desires, we're not all tempted by the same things. In other words, what you're tempted with might not be a temptation to me. But what I'm tempted with might not be a temptation to you. It all depends on what we desire or what we lust for. Now, the reason the Bible uses the word lust is because lust implies that it's more than just a desire. It's a very strong desire for something. And the stronger the desire is, the stronger the temptation. That's why the Bible uses the word lust instead of desire. Lust is what draws us away from God and from the safety that God provides. Now, let's be honest. As Christians, we should have a desire for God. How many of you have a desire for God? Yes. But I'll be honest with you, even though you have a desire for God, you probably have a stronger desire for the things of the world. And it might not be all the things of the world. It might be just certain things of the world. But the majority of us, even though we desire God, we also desire certain things of the world. And it's those desires, those strong desires, that have the tendency to pull us away from God. Some of you, maybe you weren't popular in high school and you always wanted to be, so when you got out and you started making a little bit of money, you wanted to run with the cool crowd. And so you had this desire to run with the cool crowd. Now, you love God and you have a desire for God, but you also have a desire to run with the right group of people. So you started running with those people, and what you didn't realize is they pulled you away from God and you started doing cer certain things that you shouldn't have been doing. But it was your desire to run with the cool crowd that pulled you away from God. And what you didn't know is, I am the cool crowd. People, all the angels want to be around me. And when you get to heaven, you're going to find out, Pastor Allen was the cool crowd. But you see, that's the way it works. It works the same way with kids as it does for adults. You might have a child that really desires something and, and let's be honest let's just make it more specific maybe you have a daughter that's boy crazy and they're a good christian they love the lord so they have a desire for god but they have a greater desire a stronger desire for a boyfriend and you really have to watch your daughter because that strong desire is what pulls her away from god and that's what james is telling us here what draws us away from god is our own lust we need to realize that now, if that's true, and it is true, if it's our own lust that draws us away from God, then what role does the devil play in tempting us? In other words, if we're drawn away by our own lust, does that mean that the devil doesn't play a part in temptation? Have we given too much credit to the devil when we blame him for the temptations that we have? No, not at all. Listen to me. The devil plays a major role in tempting you because he's the one who entices you look back at verse number 14 and I want you to underline the word entice but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed now enticed is translated from the Greek word de la adzo which is derived from the root word de la ar now that's the correct way to pronounce it but I can't pronounce it like that so when I was memorizing the Greek words in my Greek classes I memorized it as deliadzo and deliar so that's the way I'm gonna say it but if you go somewhere else and you have someone who really is into the correct pronunciation they're gonna say it differently but I'm not gonna do that so let me say that again Entice is translated from the Greek word deliadzo which is derived from the root word deliar and deliar is a fishing term that means bait or lure now fishermen use bait or lures to entice fish to bite their hook you put something on your hook to entice that fish to bite your hook and that's what deliadzo means it means to use a lure or bait to try and entice us or seduce us to do something that we shouldn't do you see because demonic spirits know what we lust after they also know exactly what bait to use to draw us away from God and to try to get us to do something that we shouldn't do. So in essence, the devil uses the things we lust after as bait in order to tempt us to sin. 
And that's what James is teaching us. Now, turn back to Matthew chapter 6, verse 13, and let's see how this fits into the Lord's Prayer. It says in verse 13, And lead us not into temptation. Now, this is not written in a way that's easy to understand because it's written in the vernacular of the 1600s. And people, we don't speak like that today. In fact, we would think it was very weird if someone started speaking in King James. We don't do that. So let me tell you what this is saying in today's language. Today we would say, lead us away from temptation. We would not say, lead us not into temptation. We would say, lead us away from temptation. That's what this is saying. So we're to pray that God would lead us away from the things that lure us away from him and into sin. To lead us away from the things that entice us to do the things that we shouldn't do. Now, whenever we pray this, we need to be ready for the struggle that's going to take place inside of us. Because our flesh will want to chase after the things we lust for, but our spirit will want to follow God. So there's a struggle inside of us. A struggle on which way to go. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Psalms, chapter 25, verse number 12, and I'm going to show you what I'm talking about. Because this struggle is something that everyone faces that's a Christian. Now, the type of struggle is depends on what you lust after, and that's different for everyone, but we all experience this struggle. Look with me in Psalms 25, verse 12. Who are those who fear the Lord? Now, do you notice anything weird about that word, Lord? You should. It's in all caps, because it is in your Bible. Now, if it's in all caps, what does that mean? It means that that is translated from the Hebrew word Yahweh. And Yahweh is the redeeming, covenant-keeping name of God. So what this is telling us is this is talking to those who were redeemed and in a covenant relationship with God. Everyone with me? So it says, who are those who fear the Lord? Well, it's those who are redeemed and are in a covenant relationship with him. And then it goes far further. He, talking about Yahweh, will show them, the Christians today, or those who are redeemed and in a covenant relationship with him, the path they should choose. Now, God's path will always lead you away from temptation. In fact, his path will keep you from being tempted to do the things you shouldn't do and from going to the places you shouldn't go. And to keep you going or heading in the right direction. But ultimately, the choice is yours on which path you take. Because God has given you a free will. Do you go down the path to chase after the things you lust for? Or do you go down the path that God's laid out before you? The whole reason you're coming to church is to find out the path that God wants you to take. You're supposed to be learning what God wants you to do. Now, it's pretty easy to do what God wants you to do on Sunday morning. But tomorrow morning, Monday morning, Tuesday morning, maybe when you get off work, you're going to have a struggle because you're going to have this choice. Do you chase after the things you lust after or do you chase after the things of God? Do you follow God's path or do you follow the path of the things you lust for. And that's the struggle that takes place within us. Ultimately, though, the choice is ours because God has given us a free will. Look at verse 12 again, and I want you to notice the phrase, should choose. It says, who are those who fear the Lord? He will show them the path they should choose. Now, the phrase should choose implies that there's a choice involved. In other words, God will tell you what to do and where to go to keep from being tempted. But people, it's up to you to choose whether you listen to God or not. Now, how do you apply this to prayer? Well, first of all, you have to be honest with yourself and honest about your spouse and honest about your children. You don't have to be honest to anyone else, but you have to at least be honest to yourself about yourself and about your children. Because you have to know what your weaknesses are. If you're not honest with yourself, you're not honest about the root issue of the things that draw you away from God. You see, because you're a Christian, there's within you this desire to serve God and go down the path that he wants. But because you have the atomic nature, there are certain things inside you that want what the world has to offer. Now, not all the things the world has to offer, but some of the things the world has to offer. And those are your weaknesses. 
Those are the things that draw you away from God. Those are the things the devil uses to lure you or entice you away from God. Some of you come to church for a month or two and do really well. And then you drop out for six months. Why did you drop out? Well, if you would be honest with yourself, there's something that drew you away from God. And when you look inside of you, there's this lust. There's this desire within you that draws you away from God. And you have to know that. And when you get in your prayer time and it comes to God, lead us away from temptation. Or if you want to keep with the King James Word, lead us not to temptation. You have to say, God, I know your desire is to give me this path that's after you, but... You know, Lord, I've always had this weakness. I've always had this desire for this, and this is what tempts me. This is what causes me to do that. And when you are honest with yourself, you say, God, help me. Help me to do the things I need to do to stay on your path. Show me what I can do that creates a boundary. Show me what I need to do to stop me from going down this way. Now, what is with your children? You have to be honest about their weaknesses. You have to look at your children. You have to realize... If they're a Christian, yes, they desire God. But then you begin to see maybe they desire a boyfriend or girlfriend more. Maybe they desire being popular more. Maybe they desire fitting in more important than being obedient to God. And so you have to understand those are the things the devil is going to use to draw them away from God. He's going to use those desires to bait them or lure them away from God and into doing things they shouldn't do. Maybe they would take drugs just to fit in. Maybe they want to party just to fit in. Maybe it's like parents like children. So you have to be honest about yourself, about your children. You come to God and you say, God, show me those desires within me that are not good. Show me those things that lead me into temptation. Show me the root issue that causes me to fall away from you. And when you get honest with God, God gets honest with you. What you don't know, and the reason I can't actually say, here's how I pray. Because if I started praying, I would reveal certain weaknesses about my family. And I don't have a right to do that. But I know the weaknesses of Micah Joy. I know the weaknesses of Macy because I'm objective. Some of you are not objective about your children. The reason you're not objective is probably you have the very same weaknesses they have. Your kids are going through the very same things you went through. You've never overcome it. So you try to justify that it's not that big a deal. And the reason you're not close to God is the same reason they're not going to be close to God. But you don't know the heartache that might cause them. So you get real with God and you say, God, you know what Micah Joy is like. God, you know what Macy is like. Now, Father, these are the things that draw them away. And, Lord, I'm praying that you'd work on their heart, that you would show them what is really important in this life, what really matters in this life. God, show them the path to be able to set boundaries, to so desire you that those things are no longer strong desires, but they're weak desires compared with the desire to serve you. And that's where you really get real with God. And most of us go through the Lord's Prayer and we think it's a statutory prayer to be recited word for word. And that's not what, it's at, what it is at all. It's an outline for us to follow and it deals with the serious issues of life. Now, let's move on. Turn back to Matthew chapter 6 verse 13 and let's look at the second part of this verse. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now the word evil is translated from the Greek word paneros. And paniros refers to anything grievous, painful, or wicked. So what you're doing is praying that God would deliver you or keep you from anything that will cause you or your family grief, pain, or harm. You're literally praying a hedge of protection around you, your mate, and your children. Now, everyone knows what I mean by hedge, right? I'm not talking about shrubs. In the context that I'm using the word hedge... A hedge refers to something that provides protection or defense. In fact, in the story of Job, what you'll find is that the devil was complaining to God. And the reason he was complaining to God was because he couldn't touch Job. But the reason he couldn't touch Job is because God had placed a hedge around him. 
Turn to Job chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. It says, does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied. Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? Not just around Job, but Job prayed every day for his children, his extended family. He also prayed for his material things. So God had placed a hedge around him, around his family, and around everything that he owned. Then it goes further. You have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and his herds are spread throughout the lands. In other words, Satan could not touch Job because God had placed a hedge of protection around him. And it wasn't until God removed this hedge of protection that Satan could touch him. So what Jesus is telling you to do is to pray a hedge of protection around yourself, around your children, and around your home. Now when I do this, I pray for a hedge of protection of guardian angels because I believe that it's the guardian angels' responsibility to protect us, and I believe that because that's what the scriptures teach. In fact, let me give you a few scriptures that talk about what I would consider to be guardian angels and their job to protect us and to serve us. Would you like some scriptures on that? Look with me, if you would, in the book of Psalms, chapter 91, verse 11. For he will order his angels to protect you wherever you go. Now, I want you to see that ultimately they are God's angels. They're not our angels. It says, for he will order his angels. God is the one that created them. They're his angels. But God assigns them to us. It's their job to protect us wherever we go. Now, I don't know if you've heard this before or not. You should have, but it's true. You can't fix stupid. You can't fix stupid. The Bible says people ruin their, own li- ruin their lives by their own mistakes and then blame God for it. I want you to understand, just because you have a guardian angel doesn't mean that you can be stupid. And most of you have been stupid and you're thinking, Where's been, where has my guardian angel been? Well, you're lucky you're still alive. Because it could have been much worse. But you need to understand, according to Psalms 91, 11, he orders his angels, he orders them to protect us wherever we go. Now let's keep going. Look at Psalms 34, 7. It says, for the angel of the Lord is a guard. Now, do you notice something different about that word Lord? What do you notice? It's all caps. What does that tell you? It tells you that this word is translated from the Hebrew word Yahweh, and Yahweh is the redeeming, covenant-keeping name of God. All right? So this is going to apply to those who are redeemed in the covenant relationship with God. For the angel of the Lord is a guard. Let me tell you something. God does not need to be guarded. God is not afraid to go to sleep at night, though our God doesn't sleep. God doesn't have to worry about his backside. These angels are not guarding God. God could destroy everyone and everything, including Satan and his angels, with poof, a word. So notice what this says. For the angel of the Lord is a guard. Who's he a guard for? Well, we're going to find out for those who are redeemed in the covenant relationship with him. It says, he surrounds and defends all who fear him. Who is him? Yahweh. These angels are guards to surround and defend those who are in a covenant relationship with God. Wow, yeah. Now, when you say something surrounds and defends, what is that? That's a hedge of protection. There's the scripture, Matthew 18, 10. See that you do not despise one of these little ones talking about children who are defenseless. For I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. Now, here's what's interesting. It says they're angels. Now, we just found out that all angels are ultimately God's. He's the one that created them. They're his. But he orders them to do things for us. So here's what's interesting. This tells us that he assigns every one of us angels. And he tells you, you better be careful because these little ones, their angels are in the face of God. So when you're abusing these little ones, let me tell you something. Even though God sees it, these angels are up there saying, do you see? God, you assigned me to them and look at what they're doing. I think there's a special place in hell for people who abuse children. I believe that. And the Bible tells us that angels escort us to the either where we're going to go, which hopefully will be heaven. But for some of you, 
hell. And they're not going to be too easy about it when they escort you to that place because you hurt the ones they were assigned to. Keep going. Hebrews 1.14. Are not all angels, not some angels, not most angels, not many angels, all angels. Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? So these angels are God's. But they're ministering spirits. And why are they ministering spirits? Does God need to be ministered to? No. They're ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation. Us. So when I come to this part of the Lord's Prayer, I pray for a hedge of protection of guardian angels to be around me and my family. But I take it a step further. I ask God to do something that only God can do. You see, God has two attributes that sets him apart from everyone else. Well, if you want to be honest, God has five attributes, but I'm only going to employ two when I'm praying for protection of family, so that's the only ones we're going to talk about this morning. But I want you to understand, there are five attributes of God that no one possesses. The devil doesn't possess them. Angels don't possess them. There are five different attributes of God that, uh, that only God possesses. But I am going to employ two of them when I'm play, praying for protection over my family. Now the first one is omnipresence. Omnipresence means that God is everywhere at all times. Now I want you to notice that I said at all times. You see, I grew up hearing from different pastors that God was everywhere at one time. How many of you grew up hearing that? Yeah. God is omnipresent. He's everywhere at one time. And I can remember sitting in my very first theology class and we were talking about the attributes of God and we were going through the three omnis. Omnipotent, uh, omniscient, omnipresent. We got to omnipresent and he defined God this way. The, the professor did. He said, God is everywhere at all times. And I wanted to raise my hand and correct him, but I realized he's the professor, I'm the student. But I wanted to say, oh, no, 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 no. God is everywhere at one time. That's what I was thinking because that's what I've been taught. And then he started going through the scriptures and showed that God is everywhere at all times. You see, we have the tendency to think of God as being unrestricted by space, but he's restricted by time. But the Bible teaches that God is not only unrestricted by space, but he's also unrestricted by time. People, God is everywhere at all times. In other words, God is everywhere, past, present, and future, simultaneously. I know. It blows your mind. But that's why God knows the future. It's because he's in the past, present, and future simultaneously. In other words, at the same time. Some of you wonder, well, how in the world could Jesus die for my sins? Because he died 2,000 years ago and I'm living here. It's because Jesus is very God of very God, which means that he has these same attributes. Not only that, the Holy Spirit is God. That's what we talk about in the Trinity. So when Jesus was back there... 2,000 years in the future, when I said, Jesus, I want you to be Lord, the Holy Spirit reached out and grabbed my spirit, immersed me in the body of Christ this is, that was just getting ready to suffer. And he was made my sin. We were joined and became one spirit. Why? How? Because God is omnipresent. God is in the past, present, and future simultaneously. The second attribute that I want to talk about that sets God apart from everyone else is what theologians call middle knowledge. How many of you ever heard of middle knowledge? If you've come here, you probably have. How many have never heard of middle knowledge? Well, let me explain what middle knowledge is. Middle knowledge means that God not only knows what will happen in the future, but he knows what could happen in every possible situation. Now, that'll blow your mind too, so let me say it again while you're thinking about it. Middle knowledge means that God not only knows what will happen in the future, but God knows what could happen in every possible situation. Because God not only knows what you do because he's in the future, but he also knows what man thinks. He knows how we feel. He knows all those things we don't want anyone else to know about because God knows the intentions of the heart. He knows the thoughts of the heart. He knows all of those things. But here's what's interesting about that. It's true. God not only knows what could happen, but he, or what will happen, he knows what could happen in every possible situation. And when you realize what God can do, 
it takes your prayer life to a whole nother level. Yeah. You see, because God is in the future right now, omnipresent, and because he knows what could happen in every possible situation, middle knowledge, he knows exactly what to do to deliver me from evil. Oh, my gosh. I don't know if you guys caught that, so let me say that again. I'm going to put it up on the screen. Because God is in the future right now, omnipresent, and because he knows what could happen in every possible situation, middle knowledge, he knows exactly what to do to deliver me from evil. Wow. Now, let me show you how knowing this affects the way you can pray. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to show you how I pray. My wife told me when we started this series, she said, Alan, it won't be enough to teach them how to pray. You're going to have to use examples. You're going to have to show them how you pray. And I I thought to myself, God, I don't want to do that because this is kind of an intimate part of me. And it's kind of like opening yourself up and being vulnerable. But my wife is right. And that's why I've been doing it. So let me show you how I pray when I get to this part and deliver us from evil. Say, God... Thank you for being such a good God and wanting to put a hedge of protection around me. And God, right now, I'm just praying for this hedge of protection of guardian angels around my children. I pray, God, that you would anoint these angels and that you would instruct them not only on where danger is, but where danger will be. And God, I pray that you would instruct them on how to manipulate the situations that Micah and Macy find themselves in, the circumstances surrounding them, even people in time, so that Micah and Macy are never in the same place at the same time that danger is. God, if danger is in the classroom, take them out of the classroom. If danger is down the hallway, take them the other way. God, if danger is going to be on that road and they would be in an accident, Lord, you manipulate time. You manipulate people so they are never there. God, I'm trusting you to do this in Jesus' name. And when you learn those things, then the Holy Spirit begins to speak to you And you know whether you need to pray more or less. There are times when I'm praying for that and there's a burden. And I know that God knows that there's going to be something in the future and I need to pray a little bit harder. And I need to get into it. And I start praying even more until that goes away. In the old days, they called that praying through. Today, most people don't even pray, so they don't even know what praying through is. They're just glad to pray. But let me tell you, When you do this, God does wonderful things. I can't tell you the things that God has protected my children from, protected me from, protected my wife from, because most of the time I never even see them. Because God is manipulating the situations and the circumstances surrounding me. He is manipulating manipulating people in time so that I'm never in the same place at the same time. The danger is. But every once in a while, God allows us to see things. When Lisa and I were down on Water Street and we were preaching, I was getting ready to go up to preach, and the Holy Spirit came upon my wife and said, you need to pray for Macy. She knew immediately that Macy was in danger. Now, at that time, we had three services. We had a Saturday night service, a service at 9 o'clock, and a service at 11 o'clock because our sanctuary was so small, we couldn't get everyone into it. And so Macy had come on the Saturday night service and stayed home, and Lisa had given her something to do. So I want you to, believe it or not, we had flowers at the time. (laughs) A little bit of landscaping, not much. Pastor Allen doesn't believe in landscaping. But anyways, she told her to water the flowers. And so I got up to pray, and I think, well, when I hear the story later, I thought, well, why didn't God tell me? And I'll tell you why. It's because it's my job to to preach. So God spoke to Lisa and said, Macy's in danger, and she started interceding for her. When we got home, uh, Lisa didn't want to say anything because she didn't want to scare us, but Macy came and said, Mom, something strange happened this morning. I said, well, what is it? So I went out to water the flowers, and... This man in a van pulled up, and at that time we lived right across from the Mural Home parking lot. So he pulled in, and this man was watching me. And he was watching everything that I was doing. And he said, something told me that I was in danger. And so Lisa said, well, what would you do, honey? She said, well, something told me, don't act like you're in a hurry. Don't act like you're scared. But I went over there, and I turned off the water. And I'm sorry I didn't water your flowers, but... Something said I needed to stop. And so I walked slowly to the door. Then as soon as I got in that door, I locked the door. I ran upstairs. We had two-story. I looked down, and I said, this man got out of the van, and he walked to the side of the 
house and he looked and he walked to the other side of the house and he looked and then I saw him walk to the van and he hit the van then he got inside he waited about five minutes and he drove off now I really believe with all my heart that Macy would have been taken but God leads us to pray but you have to have a relationship with him where when he speaks to you you hear him and you know how to take the doctrine that I teach you and apply it to your prayer life to make sure that God is moving in your life. Some of you are probably angry at God because, well, my angels didn't do a very good job. Again, let me repeat, even God can't fix stupid. And if you're not listening to God, which is stupid, and you're not praying, which is stupid, then no matter what the angels are doing, you still have a free choice and God allows you to do what you want to do. What I'm teaching you is to learn to listen to God, to follow God's path instead of chasing after the things that you lust after so that you can abide in God's protection. That's good teaching, Pastor Allen. Now, Let's take a few minutes and finish the seventh subject in the Lord's Prayer because I told you we would finish. And I would have a very difficult time to say we finished the Lord's Prayer if we didn't deal with the last subject, which is, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And because I learned it with the Augustinian prayer, forever and ever, amen. Now this is known, or this is what is known as a doxology. And almost every Jewish prayer at the time of Jesus Christ ended with a doxology. Now, everyone knows what a doxology is, right? If you don't, let me define it for you. A doxology is a declaration of praise to God. In fact, our English word doxology is transliterated from the Greek word doxologia, which means to give praise. You see, the Jewish culture believed that it was inappropriate to approach God without giving some form of praise. And that's true because God is worthy of praise. And it's only fitting that our prayer time should end with the time of praise because when we've been in this prayer and we've gone through all six subjects, all the way from appropriating God that he's Jehovah Rapha, he's healing my body, he's Jehovah Jireh, he's providing my, for my needs, he's Jehovah Tisikanu, he's my righteousness, all the way to coming in here and, and, and praying for his kingdom to come. God, I want your kingdom to come. I want the right attitude. You... Uh, I wasn't created for you to serve me, but I was created to serve you. I want your kingdom to come. Jesus, please come back. I want your will in my life. And then we get to praying for God's will to be done. And then we start going through all of these things. When we pray for every one of them the way that we should, we get to the end of our prayer life and we think, man, God is good. God is so good. Now remember... John Wesley wrote, God does nothing without prayer, and it's so true. And the reason why is because God has made you a sovereign creature with a free will. So he is not going to violate your free will. But when you want his will to be done more than your own, God does mighty things in your life. And when you get to the end of your prayer and you realize that you've dealt with things like the things you lust after and you've prayed for God's protection you realize what a good God that he is you want to start praising him and it's only fitting that we should end our prayer with a time to praise him for who he is for what he is for what he's done and for what he will do today tomorrow and in the future and people that's how you're supposed to end your prayer time now, I'll be honest with you when I first started uh, in the ministry because I had the gift of teaching, the Bible just made sense. And praying was hard for me. So if you gave me a choice, do you want to read the Bible or do you want to pray, I would always choose read the Bible. 30 years later, if you ask me, do you want to read the Bible or do you want to pray? I want to pray. Now, it didn't start off that way. When I first started praying, I'm telling you what, and after I'd prayed for five minutes, I'd prayed for everything in the world, I thought. But when I learned what true prayer was and I learned this outline and what it was all about and started following this outline, man, I went from five minutes to 20 minutes, went from 20 minutes to 30 minutes, went from 30 minutes to 45 minutes, went from 45 minutes to an hour. You know, I get up and I pray. 
but I don't feel like I'm ever finished. So I get ready, come to church, and then I come in to finish up my prayer time. And most of the time I spend the last 30 minutes just in here praying. I've said this before. I'm not the best speaker. I'm not the best leader. But God has blessed our church amazingly. But I'll tell you why. No one works harder than me, and no one believes more in the power of prayer than me. And when you pray, God does great things.